Every single day that we wake up, we have been gifted the opportunity of choice. You can choose to be happy or you can choose to be sad. I don't care what your situation is. You should never allow your situation to define who you are as a person. The outside is the physical manifestation of what goes on inside the brain. Things do not just happen. No one just rear-ends your car. You don't just become broke. Broke is a mindset. Things don't just happen. Your pocketbook is not just below balance or on zero. You're not just overweight, just by chance you're just overweight. Things don't just happen. Your words can trip you. What you say can cause you to stumble. It can keep you from your potential. You're not snared by what you think. Negative thoughts come to us all. When you speak them out, you give them life. That's when they become a reality. When you say, I'll never get back in shape, it becomes more difficult. You just made it harder. When you say, I never get any good breaks, that stops the favor that was ordained for you. If you say, I'm not that talented, I don't have a good personality. That is setting the limits for your life. That is calling in mediocrity. So the recognition that negative thinking and unhappy states actually do nothing to change anything. If anything, they make it worse. So if, you, if there's enough awareness and you can suddenly look at that, and then you can ask yourself from the point of, from the pers deeper perspective of awareness, do I want to continue to think these thoughts? Is that helpful or good? Do I really want that? Ask yourself, what is my limiting step? What is the one factor that determines the speed at which I achieve my goal or whether I achieve it at all? Once you've answered this question, you can move on to making a plan for how to accomplish your goals by eliminating this limiting factor. Your ability to identify your limiting step is one of the best demonstrations of your intelligence. And your capacity to eliminate this limiting step is one of the best demonstrations of your overall competence in achieving anything you want. It's our thoughts that are manifesting this world. Now you could say that's a spiritual thing and now I say not only is it spiritual, now it is fundamental basic science of the universe. And it says then the thoughts are creative. Well, if the thoughts are creative, then who is having the thought? And you start to realize, I'm having the thought. Well, then the truth is simple. As Richard Con Henry said, you are creating this world with your mental activity and your spirituality combined. And then all of a sudden it says, well, then if I'm creating the world, then my original belief that when things didn't go right, I was a victim. <laughs> the universe wasn't supporting me. You know, it's like, oh, I try so hard and the universe is not giving me things. It turns 180 degrees around. And it basically says this, we are creating this world. And then I say, your mind is creating this world. Although you cannot change conditions or circumstance, you don't have to let them control you. We can't control what's going on outside, but we can control what's going on inside. You know? And unfortunately, I don't think many of us have been raised to really understand that. And it's a lack of understanding that's causing all our problems. We are the only creature on the planet that's totally disoriented in our environment. <laughs> all the little squirrels, the birds, the every, all the animals, are completely at home in their environment, they blend in. You and I are totally disoriented in our environment. We've been given the mental faculties to create our own environment. However, we go right through school and we've never learned that. We have higher faculties and the average person has no knowledge of how to operate with them, how to develop them. We have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Now, those mental faculties, they're not just words, they're actually mental faculties that we can use to take control over our world and to create the environment that we want. But unfortunately, we grow up, we don't know that. We've been raised to live through by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, our physical senses. 
and we're even raised to be controlled by what's going on outside. As little kids, will you listen to what I'm telling you? Will you look at this? You know, and so it's all outside. Um, we get our report card and that tells us what kind of student we are. But it really tells us where our mind was at for a few minutes, three weeks ago. It's got nothing to do with who we are. So I think we're, we're raised in ignorance, actually. There's a very small percentage of the population that have a reasonably clear understanding of who they are and what they're capable of doing. But the ones that do are in the minority. People think that the purpose of memory is to remember the past. And that's not the purpose of memory. The purpose of memory is to extract out from the past lessons to structure the future. And that, that's the purpose of personal memory. And so you're done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. So if you have a traumatic memory, for example, that's really obsessing you, if you analyze that memory to the point where you figured out how you put yourself at risk and you can determine how you might avoid that in the future, then the emotion associated with that goes away. So memory is a, has a very pragmatic function. And cultural memory is the same thing, is that we need to extract out stories from our past that structure our future. And we need that because, well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, let's say, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering. Because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering. And what you have to set against that is a noble and worthwhile purpose. And hopefully, hopefully your determination of that purpose is buttressed to some degree by the wisdom of the past because you can't conjure something like that up on your own. And if you provide people with nobility of purpose, then they can tolerate the suffering of existence without becoming entirely corrupted by it. And cultures that don't do that, it isn't even so much that they die, it's that cultures that don't do that are dead. They're done. They don't have a story anymore. And they don't have a call to adventure. And then, well, then everyone suffers stupidly as a consequence. It's a very bad thing. So Churchill made the same observation that many of the great psychologists and, and philosophers made in the early part of the 20th century. It's like, bring the story forward and, and propagate it and make it the most noble possible story. And then you motivate people to, do, to transcend themselves, which they need to do. So, yes, he's exactly right in his diagnosis. In order for us to become abundant, we have to overcome the old personality. And that's 95% of who we are, right? Yes. So then, the side effect of the beginning of this process is a lot of discomfort. <laughs> it is a lot of discomfort because you're stepping outside the known into the unknown and now you can't predict. It's scary. No, no, it's you'd, ra you'd rather hold on to your lack. The pain, the suffering. Rather tell the story of that. At least it makes you feel something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. When you step outside and you're saying, I'm not going to complain about money any longer. I'm not going to complain about I don't have any. I'm not going to judge other people who do. I'm not going to say I can. I'm not worthy. It's never going to work. All those things got to go. I'm not going to feel lack, I'm not going to feel unworthy, I'm not going to feel separation, I'm not going to feel resentment. These are the things that are keeping my reality the same. Now it's no longer about abundance, about who you become. Mm -hmm. The most successful people are long-term thinkers. They look into the future as far as they can to determine the kind of people they want to become and the goals they want to achieve. They then come back to the present and determine the things that they will have to do or not do to achieve their desired futures. This practice of long-term thinking applies to work, career, marriage, relationships, money, and personal conduct. Successful people make sure that everything they do in the short term is consistent with where they want to end up in the long term. They practice self-discipline at all times. You see this willingness to sacrifice in people who spend many hours and even years preparing studying and upgrading their skills to make themselves more valuable so that they can have a better life in the future rather than spending most of their time socializing and having fun in the present. Your ability to think, plan and work hard in the short term and to discipline yourself to do what is right and necessary before you do what is fun and easy is the key to creating a wonderful future for yourself. Your ability to think long term is a developed skill. As you get better at it, you become more able to predict with increasing accuracy 
what is likely to happen to you in the future as the result of your actions in the present. This is a quality of the superior thinker. The common denominator of success was that successful people make a habit of doing the things that unsuccessful people don't like to do. And what were these things? It turned out that the things that successful people don't like to do are the same things that failures don't like to do either. But successful people do them anyway because they know that this is the price they have to pay if they want to enjoy greater success and rewards in the future. Successful people are more concerned with pleasing results, whereas failures were more concerned about pleasing methods. Successful, happy people were more concerned with the positive, long-term consequences of their behaviors, whereas unsuccessful people were more concerned with personal enjoyment and immediate gratification. The top people were those who were more concerned with activities that were goal-achieving, whereas average people were more concerned with activities that were tension-relieving